my 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 t-shirt <laughs> method writing t-shirt nice you have a t-shirt oh yeah with your, with your phrase jack on the back <laughs> um what, what does it say on the back Uh, is what an oh oh art is what an artist does yeah yeah that's very important that's cool i would show everybody i have method writing on my underwear so i can't show it to you sorry oh, you can why not oh why not why not <laughs> I've got my method writing book. Oh, cool. I, I, I have my method writing book right there. Oh, nice. I, I will have my one second. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have I have this one, which is you know what that is, don't you, uh, Alexandra? Oh, went, went to went Rouse, Rouse to get a chicken. Get a chicken. I love it. I used to yeah. do that all the time. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if Natalie teaches that idea or how you say that in Ukrainian. Natalie, how do you say in Ukrainian, go to Rouse to get a chicken? Uh, do you use that term when you teach it? Uh, not, not, not a lot. Not a yeah, lot. Yeah, because it doesn't translate. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's more pushitni prosho. I was showing him that book. Oh, I didn't have that. I don't have it either. Went to Ralph's. I, I it. It's it's people writing stuff. All the, some of my students, where the line about going to Ralph's to get a chicken appears in the writing. And uh, for those of you that don't know what that means, Ralph's is a supermarket here in, in Southern California. And that's where I go shopping. And I came up with the phrase, go to Ralph's to get a chicken. As when you start to write, if you don't know what you're going to write about, I always tell people, it's okay not to know what you're going to write about. Just go to Ralph's and get a chicken. You know, just write anything you want and it'll eventually become something so that phrase go to Ralph's to get a chicken means I didn't have a subject I didn't have an idea I didn't have a story I didn't have a plot or a theme I just started writing any bullshit I felt like writing and the piece ends up becoming what it becomes so uh, for my 75th birthday uh, my students put together this book and it's on Amazon and it's called Went to Ralph's to Get a Chicken. <laughs> and everything in here has got that line in it, Went to Ralph's to Get a Chicken. There are poems and stories and everything. That's nice. I think we can do the same with our phrase, I hate to write about nothing. <laughs> well, that was in a line. And that was in one of the pieces. That's yeah, a that's a good one. I hate to write about nothing. <laughs> yes, yes, it's our final, final, final piece. <laughs> okay. Well, Nicano Para, pa, Nicano Para, who is a Chilean poet, he has a short poem that says, writing poetry is the easiest thing in the world. All you have to do is improve on the blank page. Mm -hmm. So, you know. All right, shall we start? Officially. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Alexandra Costulis. I'm the founder of the San Francisco Creative Writing Institute. Um, and I've been teaching Jack Grapes method writing for 10 years in San Francisco. Um, a little bit about um, the Creative Writing Institute in San Francisco. Um, the first class we offered was method writing. And um, from that, we built an institute of creative writing um, and we offered other classes in creative writing um, to people from all walks of life, all backgrounds in um, writing from beginners all the way to professionals. 
we host readings. Um, before the pandemic, we were in person, and then uh, now um, we we were all in Zoom, and we're gonna we're making our way back to in person slowly. Um, and uh, I was a student of uh, Jack Grape um, in uh, uh, Los Angeles when I was very young, and um, working with him really changed my life. And um, teaching method writing in the last ten years um, changed the lives of a lot of my students and my own. Um, and it's been amazing, and um, we're very happy to um, to introduce uh, to you Natalie Skorikova, um, who is uh, um, my counterpart and method writing teacher in Ukraine. Um, she's living in Spain now, but she's teaching her students in Zoom, um, uh, and she has a very thriving uh, school that she started um, in Kyiv uh, called um, Method Writing Ukraine or the Jack Grapes Method Writing in Ukraine. Um, in case you didn't notice, we also have a special guest today, Jack Grapes himself, um, who invented um, method writing and um, he was here um, uh, uh, hanging out with us and listening to the first, the beginning part of the reading. So it's a special treat for me to introduce my mentor um, as well. and. Um, this is the first time we'll be offering um, this kind of international collaboration. It's been a few months of planning. Uh, we uh, did our best. We, um, uh, Natalie, uh, curated the texts and solicited them from her uh, students and then uh, chose a, a very nice variety of, of pieces that will, that are, that have a lot of tonal dynamics to them that will make you laugh, make you cry, um, uh, and all of the feelings in between. And, um, and then she and her team, uh, volunteer translators translated them into English. And then I um, looked at the translations and edited and localized them again. So um, as we've never done this before, and our, our writers are writing in Ukrainian um, and then having their work translated in English, they'll be reading it in English, which is not their native language. Uh, you know, be nice to us because we're learning, um, and um, and also take that into consideration as you're as you're listening to the readings. If you can't hear um, uh, one of the um, or can't understand um, an accent, I, I think you will be able to because I heard all of the um, writers say hello and I understood everything they said. Um, but it, let's say you couldn't understand them or you wanted to get a closer look at their text. Um, uh, Natalie will be posting the text in the chat, um, and then. Uh, um, I'm going to, uh, without further ado, um, introduce to you Natalie Skorikova. Oh, hello, hello, everyone. First of all, I want to, to say thank you that you are with us, really. Uh, that event, this reading for me is like, um, it's a ray of light in the dark, dark, dark time. That I how I feel it. And thank you so much for your support, that you decided to spend time with us and... Um, just thank you that you are with us uh, to, tonight, today, because I know that for United States, it's a morning for European, for Europe, it's, um, it's night already. And we are all from different lives, different places, but, but we are together. And uh, I hope maybe next year we will meet already offline in Ukraine. And Ukraine will be again free, independent and peaceful country. And I hope you'll be our guests there offline, not 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 on Zoom. That's that, that's my dream. Uh, yeah, I can't wait. Well, for thank that. you so much. Yeah, <laughs> Jack. Oh. oh, can you can you continue? Because if I will continue, I will cry because it's so touchable for me that we have all these people. And thank you. Well. <laughs> It would be great. I'd love to be there when that happens, as you know. Am I supposed to say a, a few words? Or something? We'd love for you to say a few words, and we're love, we love that you're here. Thank you okay, for well, um, uh, I just want you to keep in mind when you're writing, whether it's prose or poetry, that everything comes from comedy. And I learned everything about writing from doing comedy. Because when you do comedy, um, even though you want people to laugh, you have to be very serious about what you're doing. <laughs> you, you can't have any fun doing comedy. You know, let the audience have fun. But for you, it's work. 
And comedy is about very specific stuff. For instance, all the time when someone's giving a lecture, at some point, they always put on their glasses to read something. And usually, if they're giving a lecture, they're very serious. And comedy likes to make fun of people who are too serious. So if I'm making fun of a very serious poet, he might be going something like, yes, I wrote that poem when I was only 27 years old, and I'd like to read you a portion of my poem. And then they put on their glasses and they go to read. So how can we make fun of that? Well, the first thing you do is you decide they're going to miss as they put it on, and instead they're going to poke themselves in one of their eyes. But then you got to decide which eye is it going to be, which is funny. Is this funnier or is that funnier? Well, this is funnier because you really can see the glasses. Here, it's too close. So the first thing you do when you go to put on the glasses is you have to poke yourself here. The second thing you have to do is immediately, see, this is like punctuation. You put the thing there and then your hand has to go up. So you got to go, ooh, you make that little face, and then your hand goes up, so it looks like you're pulling it out. And then you put it on the correct way. So it would go like this. Yes, I first wrote the poem when I was 27 years old, and I would like now to read the poem to you. I just, ooh, soup, ooh, I, okay, there we go. So you see, comedy has to be very specific, and so does poetry and writing. You can't just do that. It's got to be figured out. That, then the hand, you pull it, you go like that, and then the hand goes back. See? And that's my opening comments on method writing. It's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. So, Alexander, what do you think? We can start oh, I think our week. Let's start. Um, I'm, I'm posting... Uh, we're going to have 18 readers and um, once again, look in the chat um, uh, for their text and uh, readers. Um, I've done all of the things on Zoom wrong, um, so uh, don't be shy. I've closed my Zoom, couldn't find anybody. Um, I've muted myself and been talking. I've poked my eye with the glasses, everything. Um, so uh, if it happens, it happens. It's part of the the joy of the moment. And we're really, I mean, your work is amazing. You got this. Um, can't wait to hear you. Yeah, and tonight we have a prose pieces and we have a poetry and we open with a with a poetry. Alessa, please. And I send in the chat your piece. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Nice to see all of you. Um, maybe a little bit about me. My life was divided in two parts as lives of all Ukrainians before the war and after the war. Before the war, I published one, only one book for children about running, which is my passion. And after the war, I started to learn uh, in the method writing school. And it was amazing and very powerful for me because the only weapon I have is my voice, my text and my language. So I could use it. And I think that we all authors are in a little army uh, which keeps moments for our generation and for future generations. And so our texts now especially are very important. My text for today is my poetry, uh, Mother's Victory. So I start, yes. <laughs> when my mother had cancer, which was eating away her brain. She came to me by train, motionless, mute, almost without memory. She couldn't even write down her name by her own hand with perfect manicure. She came motionless, but with manicure and with eyelashes painted with mascara and with hairdo. After the second chemotherapy, we all have been waiting when her hair would fall off, when we will, when we would have to dress her with scarf turban in flowers that all women in cancer department wear. Do you know why it is a turban? Because a normal scarf slips out of a bald head, but my mom didn't lose a hair. 
After the second chemotherapy, still nearly motionless, still could not hold a spoon with a soup, she asked me if I could dye the roots of her hair in blonde so she doesn't stop being beautiful and to do her hair with a hair dryer. And for the first time in my life, I did my mom's hair. I did it slowly, a little worried, as everything that I do for the first time. As if I was preparing her for the beauty contest, as if I was paying for all those years when she was making my hair, when I was a child that had a long, magnificent hair. And then I started driving. It was my first winter driving, but because I was feeling a great responsibility for my mom, I stopped being scared. I brought my mom to Ola, to my master of manicure. We arrived early, we went to the cafe not far from Ola's place. We had a good coffee with an apple pie. I don't remember when was the last time I invited my mom for coffee with a pie, if not for the manicure. We wouldn't leave this one more moment. Her illness for me was the first war in my life. Very difficult war, unannounced war. Why in my life are all wars unannounced? It is always the same. There is a first explosion and I understand everything. I understand everything. I know how to put myself in someone else's shoes. I know how to listen silently without interrupting. Even then, I did not interrupt my brother when we received mom's diagnosis. I listened to him silently to the last words. I understood everything. I just hoped that it was a mistake, but it was not. We immediately said to our mom, we stand with you. We didn't express our deep concerns. We closed the sky over her head and pulled out our weapons, all that we had. In the war, the most important is not to be left alone with oneself and just trust those who are stronger, even if they are your children who logically cannot be stronger than parents. And mom once again became mom, even more beautiful, even more tender. And that is why I wanted to say, when we are at war and you plant salads and sunflowers, when you teach children to draw Picasso paintings, remind them how to write because that is very important. When you wear red lipstick or even without your hair done, you take a photo of your smile, why not? When you sort cardboards and plastic, when you learn 10 words in Italian, when you open a bottle of wine from 2010, which you have found by accident in your basement, you allow yourself to live. Do not feel guilty for that. Feel anything, sadness, pain, happiness, anything, but not guilt. I think that our army is now there for that. And don't forget to pray. Even if you have never done it before, even if you wear a red lipstick with a perfect manicure. Do as all of us when our mom was winning and finally won in that horrible war. Mm. That was fabulous. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Alexa. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly say um, a lot of people are moved by the readings and have asked to read on the open mic. Um, we do not have an open mic for this um, reading. We're giving the Ukrainian authors the floor, um, but we may have a second reading um, uh, later. Um, so um, keep that in mind and um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Okay. Artem, please. Hi everybody, my name is Poppy Kartem. I'm from Brovary, a small town near the Kiev. Before war, I was a mechanical engineer and an aspiring writer. Now I am serving in armed force of Ukraine. My position is loader of mortar. And here is my text, uh, it's called An Icon. An Icon. Miss, would you like to buy an icon? The saleswoman asks. The saleswoman keeps her eyes on the girl, her gaze unwavering as she thinks she identifies a possible customer from the male crowd. A young, pale, bewildered girl, it looks like she has some cash in her. This is Saint Nicholas. It's a very powerful icon for fulfillment of desires, marriage, peace, wealth, big luck, she continues. I look up uh, at the icon. 
It's a white bearded old man dressed in golden clothes holding a big book on his left hand inside a 12 by 20 inches glass frame. He's and blinking and sadly looks me in the eyes. It feels like he's embarrassed by his golden brocade clothes, by his high embroidered with silver and pearls claw book, by his inlaid with a diamond encrusted big book which says absolutely different things. It talks about other treasure. He is ashamed and embarrassed, and so am I. 1,500 grivnas. It's a quite in inexpensive and an icon consecrated in Kiev Pecher's Laura. Saleswoman would not slow down. I keep noticing. Her smile is white and yellow teased. In Kiev, fucking shit, Moscow patriarchated Pecher's Laura. Thank you. I already have one. My answer is dry and short. My icon is small. My icon is just a faded uh, four by six inch photo. His bird is black and curvy. He is dressed in a light sported military uniform and he has a Pika machine gun in his hands. My knight, Nicholas, Saint Nicholas. He has never been inside the church. He has never known any prayer, neither on behalf nor for repose, except two, more action than words. Love for me, hate for them. The Russians, the occupiers. Mirosia was born from the first prayer. Now she is in Poland with his grandma, and God. Second prayer, post-mortem, crossed to me when he was killed by the Russian in uh, 2016. I am buying chicken, rice, cabbage, and carrots. I am coming back home. Every volunteer, real, useful, not for social media admiration volunteer, except infinite tests from close and distant troops, have one additional, principally not so important, but everyday task. Do not croak from hunger and lack of sleep. But I cannot croak. It is strictly unacceptable. Not now. One task, another task. One seat of rice, another seat, a box, one more box, one more track of boxes. My apartment is no longer an apartment, but a storehouse, where between boxes, packs of socks, tourniquets, collimators, night vision goggles, cardans, sleeping bags, sleeping pads, and other stuff, oblivious or unexpected due to list, another list, many list, so many list, verbal or writing, sending by email or text messages, infinite lists of infinite needs, lurks all my belongings, table, bed, wardrobe, and two ficuses. They have grown so big, Nick's present, a long time ago. Look here, babe, it's our job for today. To text me and send files. I opened the attached photos. Oh, it's my favorite. A cracked z labeled tank. Bullet scared Russian armored vehicle. And Russian. Dead Russians. Part of dead Russians. So many parts. It should be more. Every occupier should be exploded in parts. Motherfuckers. Fucking compost. So lovely. Kick their ass, honey, and send me new pics. I text him back. As you wish, my queen, he answers. He has begun to write to me more often. Who knows why? Obliviously why? I can, tell, I can tell him anything. What should I say? Maybe that I have an icon with his deceased sergeant? Take care and send me more, I text him back. Maybe someday, who knows when, maybe when Tor will send me the last fortune and I will pack my last books, maybe when, what do you say, Nick? Nick keeps silence. Nick doesn't judge. He will not judge. Maybe someday I will remember the first prayer. Maybe. Oh, but yeah. now I'm looking at bloody photos again, smiling, making my fifth coffee cup for today and starting to assemble my new box due to the list of needs. Calimators, two. Night vision goggles, one. Socks, size L, 20 pairs. Cigarettes, three blocks. Paracetamols, 40 tab tables. Anti-flu, 20 sachets. Glasses, plus five, one. Prayer book, 
one. Wow. Fabulous. Fabulous. It's so difficult not to, like not to say after each piece of some words. <laughs> Thank you, Artem. Thank you so much. Okay, we are going. Christina. Hello, everyone. I'm Christina. Uh, I'm a mother, a wife, a writer. I am reading a book and I hope I will finish it this year. Um, I would like to say that it is a great pleasure for me and uh, a big opportunity. Thank you. So I just want to add that Christina has already finished her book. We're just editing this. <laughs> yes. And, and as Jack said, we are we 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 not we not right we are we are rewriting right Jack yeah yeah we don't write we are rewriting <laughs> so today is uh, in search i am searching for my notebook i write down my appointments plans notes poems in there i love to write a lot i have already spent half of the morning trying to find this blue listener of my thoughts then start to drink some coffee with milk and afterwards search for it again. And later my Tenazi stopped to cook breakfast for my daughter and then went on with my search. It seemed that something went wrong with the compasses inside me, which used to be very accurate. Christina, your sound, uh, you turn off your sound. Uh, again i'm sorry that was me I, I i apologize i thought that i was muting a new person that was coming in I, it's sorry it's beautiful writing do you hear me yeah can you yeah, start right now yeah. okay it seems that something went wrong with the compasses inside me which used to be very accurate i'm looking for the place their hands should point to but they're just moving around as if they're crazy my eyes are closing and I can't open them. I'm moving around the apartment, shuffling my feet on the white tile. I haven't remembered the layout of the rooms yet and in which way the doors open. While choosing between scrambled eggs and cheesecake, I felt I was no longer hungry. I will have another cup of coffee and without any milk. I'm moving around trying to remember which bucket I should choose to throw away the pepper. The yellow one is for plastic. The blue one is for pepper. How much longer will all this last? I have less and less time left for my dreams, my wishes, my plans. Only during short gaps between making soup for my registering documents for legalization in the foreign country and digesting the news from Ukraine, only between the rings of my phone that only peep and enrage me, but no longer connect me with my grandpa and granny who remained in Izum. Somewhere I have lost myself. I can find any satisfaction or joy or happiness in anything. I can't find the smile of mine I used to have. I have lost it. I'm learning to laugh. To laugh like I did when I came to our Yalta for the first time and my nose got immediately burned and white stripes started to peel off it. And I saw the sea and ate pahlava for the first time in my life. To smile like I did when I entered at Kharkiv University for the first time and celebrated at the McDonald's with the tastiest cheeseburger in the world. And then during the whole week afterwards to save up some money, I walked on foot instead of going by subway. And these walks made me even happier. I smiled like a person who can love, who is given flowers, who is written letters to, to smile like I did when holding my baby in my arms for the first time, who smelled like body, like my, my body and milk. All these pieces that had made up my smile reminded in the memory, mine in my phones. I don't dare to look through the photos in it because I can't cry anymore. I talk a lot so as not to burst out crying. And I'm searching and searching and searching to find myself. 
Probably I should use all the chances life has given me to learn the new language, cuisine, and culture. But instead, I beg, I bake Ukrainian traditional Easter cakes, paski, and bless them like my granny uh, taught me to do. Instead of paella borsh, instead of parks writing, instead of chances, memories. Probably it's an ungrateful thing to do to waste your life's chances. All the Instagram influencers would criticize me. How can I put myself into molecules and not have the strength to gather myself again? How much longer is it going to last? I took a pen with a blue cap, open it, put the cap nearby, touched, touched the tip of the pen with my thumb, left an ink spot. It is warm in our flat, but still I am wearing socks, white knee socks that almost reach my knees hitting my feet in the wall and making them relax. I bought the most common pen made from transport plastic with a blue cap. I hate writing with the gel ones. I remember having exactly the same one at school and I bought a stem with ink for it. I immediately bent up the clip of the cap and it stuck out in a strange way. I was strange too. I am strange even now. I want to tell everyone more and more often and louder that we are from Ukraine, but as soon as I start, I burst out crying. I would like to get, to get up early and have time to do a lot, but I can't because I go to sleep at 1 a.m. I can cook pasta with sausages and can also cook exactly the same, the crayfish soup as they cook in a Michelin star restaurants. I can sweep the house clean with a straw broom and use a new robot vacuum cleaners that wash floors and windows. I like ex exquisite restaurants, but I really love at home get togethers. In most cases, I would rather cook myself and invite my guests to my place. I can live in a dormitory room with three unknown girls and in the 300 square meters house with my husband and our two daughters. I bought my clothes in the Barabashova market at Zara and, the, and at the LV and Dior shops. I went by subway and have driven a red Porsche Cabriolet. I had a lot and have, I have lost a lot, but I've never lost everything, including the air that I breathed. Mm. I have a feeling that I have lost something important. My main treasures are of course near me, they hug me, sleep with their noses breathing out on my neck. But something big and important was left there. By there, I mean my home, Ukraine, Kharkiv. The house can be taken abroad. Even if you take with you, with you each brick, every crumb of concrete, each planted tulip, you can't make the house to be the same as it used to be. How can I say that I'm missing all of these things? Whom can I tell this to? For what? I put the cap back on the pen. All of a sudden I see my notebook. It lies on the table in front of me. As un 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 unnoticeable as I am, it has been found. Maybe I will also find myself someday. Oh my God. These, these poems have to be published. Natalie, Alexandra, at some point, we got to do a book of everything we're hearing today. Let's do it. This is amazing. Let's do it. Wow. Uh, for people who are new to write from the gut, um, normally what we do in the chat is um, after, as people read, and feel free to do it, American uh, writers, when people are moved, they put the, the line in the chat that really moved them. Um, so I see that someone put, I talk a lot so as not to burst out crying and said, thank you for that line. Um, and we definitely will publish them. Um, we're just figuring out how. And I, and I think online and, and in print is the way to go. I, Jack, thank you for, for this. And I, I love your commentary. It feels like we're at a real, like a live, you know, an in-person poetry reading. Um, where you hear the ums and ahs of the audience, which makes it more real. Um, uh, just quickly for people who are trying to read along, like I'm getting messages saying I can't find the PDF. So um, uh, we're gonna post the PDF 
of each reader um, right before they start reading or as they're reading. Um, and then just click on that in the chat to, and then click open. Um, don't click on where it says all the names. Um, uh, that will not get you nowhere. Um, you have to scroll down uh, to right before. So you kind of have to catch it um, at, right before each reader. Keep an eye for the chat. Can, can I just say something to Christina? Um, Christina, I'm from Louisiana in the United States. And Louisiana is the place where all the crayfish are caught. <clears throat> and so I grew up eating shrimp and crabs and crayfish. But I want to just let you know something. This is interesting. Everybody in America pronounces that word the way it's spelled, crayfish. But that's not how we pronounce it in Louisiana. We pronounce it crawfish. Craw, not cray, but craw. And everybody in America pronounces it wrong, except in Louisiana. And we pronounce it the way it's supposed to be pronounced. So the next Thanks. time you read that, say crawfish, and someone's going to come up to you and go, you're Ukrainian, but did you grow up in Louisiana? <laughs> <laughs> I have relatives there, I will ask. <laughs> or I, will, I will answer. Thank you so much. I will know. Thank you. Loved your piece. Loved it. Me too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Igor, please, your turn. And I will, I will send your text in the chat. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Igor, a давай трішки, Igor, зачекайте, давайте трішки голосніше, трішки голосніше, ближче до мікрофону, щоб ми вас добре і не поспішайте. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Igor. Before the war, I lived in Eastern Ukraine and was an entrepreneur and journalist. Then I became a soldier, then a refugee. Now I live in Lviv and become a writer. My book This Two book, books. This book in English on Amazon, uh, the Chronicle of One Battalion. My text. Memories of Soviet Union patriotic education. From the first to the third grade, we had a teacher named Alexandra Ilarionina. She was old and unmarried. In a long dress below the knees, she preferred her students to become leading representatives of the working class. Hegemons, she called them. She did not approve of the intelligentsia. I didn't want to be a hegemon. I knew from childhood that I was a genius. I was born longing for fame, wealth, a bicycle with a motor and woman. That's right, woman. In the fourth grade, we were visited by a true celestial creature. She looked like Mary Poppins. And her name was Valentina Ivanina. She was young and unmarried. Wearing short skirt and uh, nylon stockings on her teacher's crazy legs. And how hard the idealized intelligentsia. Since then, I still feel like an intelligentsia. 
Юлин за самые холидейс, ши тревел эпивиз ау класс, ту за сити герой оф Сталинград. Он за бих финно угрик риве. We live it at a campsite on the island of Crete, opposite Stalingrad. Yes, it is Crete. Not that Crete, no. But it's also Crete. Well, we were taken on all excursions, as provided by patriotic upbringing, museums, Mamaev Hill, House of Power, the power plant. Museums again, House of Paolo, Mamaev. Interstate contact happened that year between Nixon and Brezhnev. Brezhnev Nixon. And then American exhibitions arrived in the USSR. They took use to one in Stalingrad. I was 20 years old. Can I say that I was impressed by the exhibition? Impressed, this is absolutely not the right word. I had to compare the happiness of traveling on a gypsy car with models of the American car industry. And we have never seen such machine guillotines. Even in movie or hallucination. And a bunch of colorful magazine switch cards. And you can take them yourself for free. So that is a gift. As the old Winnie the Pooh said. And more, spacecraft, astronauts, suits, and everything Israel, you can touch it. Allegedly, we were told that the same space suits were in the USSR, but they were never shows to use. After Stalingrad, I have been imbued with an American exhibition. There was no room left in my freaking head for the Battle of Stalingrad. An extensive system of short Soviet patriotic upbringing has fallen from the one American exhibition. Take my word. Like I said, we live it in a camp, so you know. It's days free from trips to the city hero. We went swimming in the lake. Right here on the island. Our teacher had swum with us. US one. She was making a bikini, young and beautiful. They were in love with our teacher. I'm talking about youth, but sons. But sons a boys in slang. By the way, the word patsans comes from pats in Yiddish. Every intelligent person knows what pats means. So translate the word patsans according to our meaning. And, and mental. No need to pronounce it. <coughs> so that's semantic proof, I'm telling you. <coughs> Take my word. We also went to the steep bank of the Volga River. It was impossible to swim there. A strong stream will take you to unknown depths with the host of the Persian princess, which was once drawn it the way by Stepan Razin. And most importantly, the banks of the majestic river are littered is did fish kill it by turbines of the hydroelectric power plant. Few belugas and sturgeons were carried 
ashore by waves and streams with broken skulls. By the time the Stargeons was thrown ashore, it was rotted. Stargeon of tense freshness. All these deposits of delicacies stank. The trembling girl didn't ever try to approach the stinking shore. But we, heroes, found pieces of steel and tore three metal carcasses. But it was hard to breathe her. It's hard to breathe her. On the banks of the Volga River, up to Wumi, one of the strongest stenches in my in talented life. I smelled a strong stench only at the garbage procession plant in Polish Katowice. But that's the smell of European civilization. On the Volga coast was the Soviet spirit. And everything European is stronger than the Soviet one. The did Sturgeons of the Volga Tsunami and the American Exhibition, Nuclear Mushroom, all of that remain in the mystery depths of my memory. This is the end. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Igor. Thank you. Uh, and I think uh, that, like, all of you uh, who saw or who heard that piece first time, you have to download it and read it, read it one more time, because it, you know, it um, explains a lot <laughs> about about what we have now, what we had um, many years ago, and what we had for a long time. Thank you, Igor. Thank you so much. Okay, let's go. Uh, Ola, please. Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to have you all here. I'm Olga, I'm originally from Kyiv. After the full-scale war has started, I firstly became an internally displaced person and uh, now a refugee living in Poland. Um, still keep working uh, for the sake of Ukrainian uh, internally displaced persons who remain in Ukraine. And uh, here is my text uh, called Gerbils and War. Uh, I just don't know if you know who uh, the gerbils, it's like such type of rodent, which is similar to mouse, but with fluffy tail, they usually live in uh, deserts. So it's like such a small pet. The first victim of Putin's assault on Ukraine was Dora the gerbil. The explosion interrupts my dreams and at first I cannot believe it. But the second blast follows and then the third and here it comes, the war. I thought it's me who is going to die, not the gerbil. No one thinks about gerbils in such circumstances. I thought only a week ago me, we made love in this bed, all three of us, and then drank our morning coffee with quite a random in my bedroom, man and woman, and amidst all other things, the man suddenly said, it's a matter of days until Putin starts shelling Kiev the way he did Aleppo and Grozny. He said, many people would die and I would probably die and I'm grateful I had the night. I was thinking, no, he is wrong. Not about the night, of course, but you know, about Kiev, it cannot be true. And now he could probably die. And now I could probably die. There are so many windows in my flat. I've never noticed before how much glass is in my, the, in my doors and on the balcony. I come off to the toilet, my tummy groaning from fear. Oh, please, anything but a hit when I'm like that. For the sake of energy saving, my old Soviet Khrushchevka has a window even in the toilet, a nuance that could kill me any moment. Well, that was a good and interesting life. Where are those bags? Where is everything? Where is my medicine, water? What should I take? Where is my money? God, I want some sleep and wake up some other day where there is no need to die. The gerbils sleep in the sitting room, not because they squeak, 
gerbils don't squeak. But I have my room to sleep, they have another. Sometimes men choose to sleep with the gerbils over me. And that's also okay, though maybe they regret it later when the gerbils start to scratch. Men regret, I mean, because gerbils don't care. Clara meets me standing on her hind legs. She wasn't sleeping at all or just woke up. She's black like a piece of coal. She has black eyes, anxious and attentive. But where is Dora, the gray, young and biting one? There is uh, some of my blood still on the carpet. They fought with Clara and I was breaking their fight and then uh, Dora sunk her teeth into my finger like a little bulldog. The bite is still healing. Where is Dora? Yesterday I stayed late and Dora had her floor time roaming free. I postponed catching her for the morning. Now it's 5 a.m. and I'm putting Clara into the carrying container and I'm taking her away from the windows. Clara struggles with all her four paws and a furry tail. She doesn't want to go just like me. I look for Dora. And she's done. She's not in the wardrobe under my bags. Uh, she's not behind the wardrobe, not under sofa, not under the armchair, not behind the radiator. Uh, explosions stop, but I'm scared they could start again any moment. And there is no safe place in my flat. And I'm also scared to go to the bomb shelter. I want to fall asleep. I have no strength to be. I'm almost non-existent and I fall deeper into the softness of my dream and wake up to the calls and messages. All that resembles the day of my mother's death when I woke up to hear that she was no more and the sleep was my only wish and to never be. And I wasn't ready though I expected it to come every day. And I think that's because the war is death and the death is war. Where is Dora? I yank the sofa sharply, venting my frustration, and see her on the floor near the wall. She is dead. She looks the same as when she was alive, but she is dead. And I wish I could do something to change that. Rewind the tape, save her, find her, never let her out but I know that nothing could be done. In a stupor, I take some plastic bag from the kitchen cause I scared to touch her. I'm scared to be near, so, to be so near to the death of the other living creature. She's still warm and very much flat in her deathliness. She's probably been sitting behind the sofa when I, I opened the top panicking, looking for the bag at five o'clock in the morning, searching for her. I try to be careful. And if not, she's dead and flat. I killed her. I killed Dora. I go down the stairs in my home sleepers. I step into the yard, find the trash container and leave her tiny body there. I am death. Dora's dead. I killed her. I write to my friend in Messenger. He contacts me immediately, returning the call, and I hear him crying somewhere far away in another country. It's not your fault, do you hear me? Yeah, it's all Putin's fault. My tears turn into hysterical laughter. Only two of us left now, me and Clara. In a bomb shelter, I place her little cage near the carrier of a ginger cat. There is a Labrador sleeping nearby and a Dutch hound. Children play with it. One could think it to be the garden of Eden with all those lions and lamps, but it's just the basement packed with people. Dora's bite on my finger will heal very slowly, leaving the scar and pangs of consciousness that I will be here forever. Thank you, Ola. And you can read the uh, comments uh, that people leave. Yeah, for your text. Thank you so much. Mm. <laughs> okay, um, Tanya, please, your turn. Um, 
Hi, guys. The moment you said, Tanya, your turn, uh, I don't know, my text disappeared, so I'm going to... Uh, we can uh, find it for you. It's okay. We'll put it in the chat. Yeah, okay. In the chat, there's a page. Oh, it's not there yet. Um, San Francisco. Hello, guys. Um, the last time, not the last time, the only time I was there was in the late 90s. Yeah, and I could talk about uh, riding the horses along the shore and all nice things. But you know, uh, we have this war now. So I would like, this is like a chance to say a few things to you guys, uh, to the American audience. I would like uh, to say thank you to the people of America, just to ordinary and not ordinary to all the people because without the support of all the people of the world, our war could have, had another turn. And uh, please uh, support us until we win because uh, it's also crucially important. Uh, next thing I would like to say is that um, Pushkin is Putin. And uh, all Ukrainian uh, right, uh, writers or artists are trying to participate in cancel Russian culture movement or rather postpone Russian culture movement because we strongly believe and it is this way that uh, Russia and its culture, it's the same thing. It's one thing and uh, finally with uh, this war and it's, um, and it's um, terrible, terrible, terrible things we have a chance uh, to prove to the world what Russia is about. We knew about it for so long, but unfortunately we didn't have Gazprom to, um, to sponsor our culture, our minds and, and, and everything like that. On the contrary, we had Russia who was always for centuries trying to, to possess Ukrainians. So there is a war and there is a chance for us to show ourselves. Um, and we will be grateful for the support. Um, and uh, lastly, yeah, well, okay, it's the same. About, my, um, about the text that um, I would like to read, it's called The Hero um, with um, a Thousand Faces. And uh, of course, everyone can recognize the title. And the whole text is, uh, is, um, evolves around this title and it symbolizes the heroism of, um, uh -huh. it's, it's, um, it's a um, devotion to Azov, Azov style defenders. You probably know about this. Um, great, great uh, grand plant in Mariupol that was um, um, supposed to stand up against Russians, but unfortunately there was no chance, no chance because our country did not get ready to war and the city of Mariupol was left just for, for takeover by Russians and uh, um, nothing could be done even by the brave um, defenders that took um, um, position at Azovstal. And perhaps you remember when these Azovstal defenders came to uh, appeared in, in the news all over the world. And um, that's all we knew about them. Those few faces we saw on the screens and a few articles we read, a few videos we, we saw, but um, we also knew that there are thousands of people at the Azovstal and that we all need to do something to, uh, to uh, help them leave the plant and not just die there for nothing. And okay, so I wrote this text. Uh, well, with the help of, uh, of the title, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Um, and I still didn't open it. Okay, one well, moment. You have to mm -hmm. click on the dots. Um, yeah, yeah. People, uh, for anyone who's curious how to open the PDF, you click twice, once on the PDF, and then to the right of it, there's three little dots, and then you open. Um, I've been getting a lot yeah, of it. It's loading. It's like, yeah. it takes a minute. And if you need help, um, we, we can also share the screen. Okay, it's here. Mm -hmm. okay, good. Okay, the hero is a thousand faces to the defenders of Azov style. He has kind eyes. He has sad eyes. She has blue eyes, enormous eyes. He's tall and strong. He is even taller. He is of average height, built solid. He looks like, you know, absolutely. He has dark hair and broad shoulders. 
She looked so good in uniform. Have you seen her? His boyish hair, you want to reach out and tussle it. Her pale blonde braid fall under her helmet. He has a magnificent beard. On the screen, it looks like rippled silk. He has a low, even voice. Before, he sounded exactly the same. Before, he looked his age, 29, here in this photo. Now he looks to be, he is beautiful, so, so beautiful and brave and thin. You'd hardly know him now with his temples and cheekbones so sharp. She sings well. He sings too. She sings so, so well. He loves to talk about his six-year-old daughter, Marianka, and his younger, Anna, the one who was born a week before. When he needs to fall asleep, he thinks of the way she smelled. He has a son, Timko, and a daughter, Ninusia, preschoolers, and his wife, he would bring the moon down from the sky for her. Her mom is the best in the world. The only person she could trust with her two daughters. He asked the woman he loves to marry him, right from there, just asked, went down on one knee and offered his hand to the phone screen. With all his brothers there applauding, you should have seen her face. For that happy face, the signal failed. For a long time, there was no signal. But he knows what she was about to say. He has had the time to get to know his Nastya. Now he dreams of having a son with her, and a daughter, and another son, and one more daughter, too. To have it like that other guy, the one with the twins, who's never seen them in real life, only on pictures, on the phone, and on video, two identical babies, peas in a pot, Yurko and Tarasik. He's a professional soccer, pro, so, a soccer player. He's a politician, just studying. She's a psychologist. He's a nuclear physicist. He trained to be a historian, but felt called to war. She used to be in marketing, a, a medic now, university, college courses. He is a professional soldier. So is he and him and he, she, the college, the academy, the military. He spent eight years at war, rotated to the front the week before. He is a Ukrainian from Poltava. He's from Kharkiv, Ukrainian too. He's from Zhitomyr. She is from Donetsk. He doesn't roll his R's a bit. It's cute. He's from Lviv, a plus scout. And he is a Belarusian and not the only one. He is from Crimea. He kids a lot. So does he. And he, Belarusian is so similar to Ukrainian. Better in English, no problem. She loves, she only smiles. In a firefighter on the shelling, he, he, and he switched to Russian. He never does. He's made it a point not to. He doesn't either. It's easier for him. He is from Volin. He's got nine wounds in him. Been lying there a month, enduring. Because next to him, he also endures. His legs missing. He moans. He is silent. He raves, but does not complain. None of them complain not even to their mothers, especially not to their mothers. She volunteered to join them after her only son died in the same war a few years ago. He was 23. She died too, a few days ago. Or the news just got out a few days ago. She could have died on any of the last 73 days of their fight on the siege for Mariupol. Many of them have died. Names are not being released yet. It's better this way, to help us believe and wait and not give up, like him, 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 her, and him. The one with beautiful eyes and deep voice, and she who sings so, so well. That's it. Um, Thank you, Tanya. Tanya, maybe uh, you can share the video because I know that you've made a video um, with this with this poem. Maybe. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh, yeah. I, 
Yeah, yeah there was like a video produced with one of the theaters, and uh, it became like virus. <laughs> what? What? How do you call it? An viral. adjective. Viral. viral. Oh gosh, thank you, thank you. So quick, Alexandra. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, viral in Facebook. Like on the ninth day, one of the shares had nine uh, had a million views. Yeah, and so we just like what I wanted to say. Uh, number three is that like really please uh, please understand that as long as we as the topic of our war is not silence we have a chance to win if our war and we here in ukraine are forgotten by the world then we don't we are not going to win because you know russian forces are so much stronger and and, and military might so please stay with us and stand for us until we win thank you thank you and Tanya, please send the, send the link, okay, to this okay, video. I was actually going to say, I, I could imagine that being like a music video or a video, and I was imagining all the faces of the soldiers at, while reading it. So I had, maybe I saw it and don't remember. You know how you pass maybe, it? Maybe, maybe. Uh -huh. Wow. But it goes together, and you have a wonderful voice. Oh, gosh. I didn't have time to prepare because all we do lately, last month, just crying. Like, the girls would uh, would uh, say the same because the losses are so, so enormous. Just horrible losses lately we've been having. Yeah. And really, really the best people are dying. And uh, we, I don't know. It seems like very, very bad right now. So thank you that at this difficult time, you're giving us this chance, Alexandra. Oh, you're welcome. Your work is beautiful. Yeah, because you are with us and you are you, you want to hear us. And that's very important that we can we can say our words. Thank that you. That was just great. Thank wow. you. We can make a deep breath and Katya. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, I'm Katarina in Ukraine or in, in English it's Kate and I was doing my PhD degree in, in psychology before the war but uh, now I'm volunteer psychologist and my husband work in, worked in IT uh, before the war but now he is in the armed forces of Ukraine and the essay, this essay which I will read, um, is about our joint experience of this war, of our feelings, of my feelings. And it's a big pleasure to be here and read my essay. Thank you. It's uh, my name is uh, I know. And let's start. Julia, would you like some olives? I ask. We stand between two windows on a small piece of floor. I'm thinking about what to buy to eat later. Not now. No, says Julia. I don't like them. They are not tasty here. The ones I ate in Greece, oh, those were delicious. If you want, you can buy them, but you will eat them alone. Give me 100 grams of Kalamata olives in this plastic lunch box for three grams, I say. I see the saleswoman pouring out 150 grams of big fat cherry olives. I don't tell her, her anything. Let it be. I still love them. It makes 45 grimness. 45 grimness is more than I expected. 45 grimness is $1.50 now. I get cash from a secret jacket pocket somewhere between my passport registration and two bank cards. Mine which is empty and my husband's which contains an entire family budget. Here I say, thank you, goodbye. I go out with my sister from a stall in, in Sihi. The, the sun begins to dazzle our eyes. Well, on one hand, I have a heavy strap of, shop, of a shopping bag, which we carry together on the 
which we carry together on the other two pairs of shoes from the second hand shop. The sneakers for 75 greenness or $2.50 that are still in, in pretty, pretty good condition and earmarks for three for 350 grimness or $11.60. The white ones. I don't know how I will wear white sneakers in my village. Or there is always a lot of dust and my bag dog martins, which were new just a month ago and are now gray and beat up. A month and a half ago, I dream and adore them. Today I'm grateful to myself for wearing them a month ago because they do not get wet, do not rub my feet, they are comfortable and warm. And you can stay in them for a long time in a bomb shelter and not freeze. I don't know when the village near Lviv managed to become home. Only a month back has passed. Jewel, take an olive, I say. Okay, says Jilla. Give me one, but you take one too. It will get stuck in my throat, sorry. Take just one, Julia says. Try at least. If I take just one, I'll be nauseous with tension, and I say and look ahead. In fact, I've been nauseous around the clock for three days. I know it's fucking psychosomatic, but I don't know how to help myself. Well, in fact, in fact, I know how, but it's a dream that must come true in the near future. A dream common to the whole nation. It's been three days since I heard his voice. The third day since he should start moving. In two weeks, Elaine, I learned to determine, to determine by the sound of the phone from what distance they are bombarding and, well, and whether there is shelling and how dangerous it is for him. Right now, the uncertainty is bombarding me with anxiety. anxiety. I know that doctors are taking care of I know that doctors are important targets. I know that I must pray to all the gods of, of all the religions. Also, I, I do not believe in any of them. I believe in the armed forces of Ukraine, and I believe that it will end. It will end for what price of each of us. I monitor all the news and try to determine where he is from the shelling, from the hidden hints. <laughs> I look for hourly reports, maps of events, fragments of phrases heard of the walkie-talkie and pray again. I scroll in my head the days when in my sophomore year at the university, I started attending as those military training for civilians every Sunday. Shit to turn cats as much plates from the last millennium, a close stickers, salax wound dressings, combat cases. A person has a maximum of 40 sound seconds for critical bleeding to apply a tourniquet. If left unattended for more than two hours, it most likely means a blood infection. If the lower part of the face is fragmented, make a tracheostomy and insert at least the body of the pan, if nothing else. We cover the wound with salux, but remember that, that it burns twice the size of the funnel around the affected area, which is still better than dying. We never examine the injured person in red zone. I feel terrible that I, that, I, that I understand just a fragment of what's going on there and what he's doing right now. 
God says, Julia, what delicious olives. That's, that's exactly what I ate in Greece. So I ask, should I go and buy more until the minibus arrives? Well, go buy them and let them fill the old lunch box. I hurry across the road and run into the still. Good afternoon again. I told you, says the saleswoman, you will return. Do you want more olives? Yes. I smile broadly and can barely stand on my feet. I feel so sick now. Please. Fill the whole lunchbox. The phone vibrates. I'm still alive. Everything is difficult, but I'm alive. I love you infinitely. And that's it. Wow. That was fabulous. Mm. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I like when uh, we can feel the whole the whole pain, the whole, I, I mean, the whole things, but by these little daily moments. Yeah. Like this piece is about what? It's about olive oils? Olives. Olives, yes. It's about olives. just olives. Kalamata olives. Yeah. I love how it opens with olives and then at the end it comes back to that. But what? You know, I, I really. I, I've enjoyed hearing, but I have to go. Unfortunately, I, you know, my day is planned out, and I, I feel so honored that you invited me, and that I got to not hear everybody. I got to see you, and just seeing everybody's faces uh, makes me feel close. And sharing this artistic experience with you, and also getting to share this this terrible time uh what's happening to your your land but i think it's going to be okay i as many of you have said I, it's going to be okay so i just want to say goodbye and i hope i see you again all of you alexandra and natalie thank you for inviting me jack it's our pleasure and thank you for everything that you've given us yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. Okay. We are moving. Rosana. We've got two more, and then we're going to take a little intermission. Yes. Um. Oh. Uh. Uh. Так, чутно? Нормально? Так, ну я буду читати. <laughs> so slowly, I will read. Um, hello, my name is Ruslana. I am from Dnipro. I live here with my three dogs, uh, adult Jack and puppy Ted and Robin. Uh, hello, fans, how I met your mother. If you know what I mean, um, my English is terrible. And in short, I'm a philosopher by education, uh, a poet by state of mind, and in general, a person who is just lucky for meeting people. Such happiness is meeting Natalie, uh, working with uh, her team as a prof reader, and uh, this invitation to read uh, also. I have only passed the first level of the method, and uh, I think this is just the beginning. Uh, glad to meet everyone and be here. So for your attention, last year's poem uh, translated by my Instagram subscriber. I will also be glad to see you uh, all as friends on my Facebook and Instagram. Uh, okay. Please post your Instagram when you get a chance after you're done reading in the chat, and we'll all friend you on your Facebook. Ruslana, потім надішуєш Instagram свій. Ah, okay. It could be later. А, Руслана, а, в, тебе, в тебе проблеми зі звуком? Може, ти вимкнеш відео? 
Будь ласка, спробуй так, бо ми тебе не чуємо. It always happens when you start to read your internet just just disappear. <laughs> you can turn off your um, camera and we can uh, share your um, pick your text if if that's easier sometimes the camera. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's some international law, it's world law. I invited Alexandra in Facebook. Oh, <laughs> А, Руслана, Руслана, ти, ти зникаєш, тебе поганий інтернет, тому дай, без відео, зараз ми чуємо тебе краще. Uh, I think we lost her. Okay, we can, she can come back and we can go to the next reader and then... Um... Okay, okay. Mia, будь ласка. Hello, everybody. I'm so glad to be there. So glad to see you all, Natalie, Alexandra, and all, all who's, who's watching us. And okay, I'm Mia Marchenko, and I'm Ukrainian writer and translator. Now I'm in Romania for the writer's residence from the National Museum of Literature. And I'm in hope of finishing my fantasy novel that I work on. <laughs> and uh, but I spent uh, the whole spring in Kyiv, uh, while all the ones were, were going. And my text for today is a real glimpse of, uh, of how it was for us being there. And when the city is besieged, besieged and um, I'm really still shocked that I should employ this world word for a city in 21st century, but still. I should. Okay, and the text is incredibly lovely. March the 21st. A few more days and it will be one month since the war started. I'm wandering over Kiev in search of meds for my neighbors. I work in post office, post office and a coffee shop for myself. At the post office, I hope to get the parcel with the poster I ordered long before the events. A post of White Raven, the hero of my novel. At the coffee shop, a chance to write some lines about him. Not a bit of personal space at home, since we hosted my father and my husband's mother. Which means, in truth, I'm wandering in the hope of keeping in touch with my writing. All such places are dead closed, though. A disoriented old man with a walking stick wanders over Pushkin's car asking if someone might know the people from the 21st flat of the fives number. Where are they? Where is everybody? He mumbles, looking at me with his eyes full of despair. Oh, and you wouldn't know also, he says. Yeah, I wouldn't know also. Never thought it could come to this, asking the passers-by if they might know the people from the neighboring house in a capital of four millions, ridiculous. But there's a few of us left now that everything is possible. Now everybody knows each other, at least in the neighborhood. You can't walk through the city center without meeting someone you know. And the map of Kiev, well, Kiev's old town is now sparkling in my head with brilliant dots of dear faces. There's Taras and Dasha. They need some eggs for today, bear in mind. There's Pani Natalia. She needs steroid pills. pills the ones that you can't find in the entire city, even if you turned it upside down. Still trying though. There's Kata, my co-writer, co and Kiev main train station, where we meet to drink coffee with a spectacular view of the white zigzags Russian rockets leave in the blue spring skies. And there's Anton and Dola. They will tell me a secret of where I can get some cat food today. Up and up over Kastelna Street. But before that, through the Latsky gates of old Kiev, and in I come just on purpose, just to save the fact. I'm local, I belong to the place, I have the right to enter. Their archangel standing guard over them won't smite me with his fiery sword. Finally, I'm up at Vladimir's Kehirka, stopping to have some rest at the church steps. A red alarm. The sound carries far all over the city. Find Kawa, run. Save yourselves, the sirens pleading. But I'm just sitting on the stairs like I'm some beggar, lacking only the beggar's hand. Bright bronze letters shine over my head, saying Milosch, 
meaning love. And the arc of friendship of the nations shines before me with the black and very distant crack painted in the very middle of it. The chaos in my head and spots before my eyes. I'm thinking about something but cannot remember a thing. A new normal for all of my days now. The one thing I don't forget are the names in the list of those who need medicine. Are you okay, a passerby ventures? Some months ago, she'd never ever utter, utter such a question, but since there are only two of us on the streets, she might as well ask. I'm fine. Enough of explaining that the tears are there because of the dust and the wind. They run and run, and I cannot do nothing about it. Some allergy, maybe. I was watching you. You were running up like a young girl, says the woman, meaning a compliment. How old am I in her eyes, I wonder? I think I must look quite old, sitting there on the stairs in the dust, with my face sleepy and my roots done three months ago. Tired to the brim and completely happy. Somewhere inside me, my hero had just made up with his one and only love, living some happy days. I'm walking further and there's an A-rate siren again. But I stroll through the park and lovers nestle inside me, their bodies intertwining, eyes blind from happiness. I'm choosing my favorite bench, the one with the Alexandrovsky costume to be on my right. A classic Kievan view, a postcard from Kiev, ideal spot from all angles. Dry talks of automatic gunfire behind me. Before me, across the river in Bravari, our forces are giving hell to the Russians. The hollow and stilly sound carries far over the Dnipro. The city is under siege. The city is fighting. The city is warming its bones on the sun. The city is undimly happy. On my right, from the church's roof, the siren wails again. Run, save yourselves. But I squint from the bright sun and put my sneakers away, sitting now with my feet on the bench, and listening not to the sounds of fighting, but mostly to the bells of Mikhailovsky Monastery, going, Yakte bene lubiti, one can only love you. Mikhailovsky bells never failed us, not once since 1240. I'll be all right as long as they know how to sing, and they are also telling the truth. I never ever loved my city so ardently. An incredibly lovely place to live, an incredibly lovely place to die. And thank you. Oh. Every time when I reread this piece, in the end, I start to cry. Thank you, Mia. <laughs> this, this is the piece. <laughs> yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. Um, OK, Ruslana, how is your internet? You are back. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for my internet. Вимкни все ж таки відео. Давай без відео. Такое может быть, я не знаю, ладно. Окей. Так, чутно. Все було нормально, щойно. Все було нормально. Це дуже смішно. Окей. Я читаю, так? Hold on. Yes, find it again. Sure. <clears throat> uh, Easter in Dnipro. Meanwhile, the morning in, is consumed by the Christian holiday. Payments are flooded with believers whose hearts uh, are flooded with disbelief, at least not with disrespect. Someone has no heart at all. It doesn't matter to Christian God and to Christian churches furthermore. She takes herself out of bed. Don't forget to feed the dog, put on her converse and an old nice rock. Not to hear abstractive chiming or even her own voice. Shit is that the voice breaking through, her heart ignoring the playlist. There is no respect to Christian churches in recorded music and in her existed head. And Christian God has already been having a snack after land. He looks like a woman trying to lose some weight, but once a year she falls. Bread and eggs are believed to be a bridge to the kingdom of God. She can't make it out. 
That's why sometimes she gives up eating bread and believes in the dietetic power of chocolate candies. In the city that smells of Cahors wine and vape pants icos, you can find a place to drink coffee, to learn French, to forget about articles. Uh, it's like sex without foreplay, but it's better to learn it with kisses, and here you must use grammar thoroughly. And uh, uh, the full set of pronouns and verbs Être et avoir. That's what Sartre wrote about, and that's what she didn't understand. Just recitation and writing down the rules of usage of dominant articles. It's the same with men, and even with miserable Christian gods. Being and nothing are the best thing to study, according to Christian canon with French existentialism, with men's messages. This morning the city wakes up. It is inventing a foolish plot in her heart. It, it is forcing out the madness of previous nights, 16 hours left to the end of the week, and she already can stand being without his eyes, like Christian God without his believers, like Frenchman without the everlasting La, like Sartre without Beauvoir, like an infantine wall without physical closeness. I dial it your number first. Who do we meet today? Thank you, Rusana. And we heard that your dogs uh, tried to help you. Sorry <laughs> yeah, for my dog, for my English, for my internet. <laughs> they were part of the chorus. I love your poems. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. I don't understand. I'm sorry. <laughs> you did a great job. And um, we had the text to guide you, uh, to guide the reader too. So um, it's okay. So do we make a little break? Yeah, let's take a little break. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, we're going to take a break. I'm going to stop the live stream. Um, for our break about five to seven minutes um, and I will stop I will pause the recording um, just remind me when we start again to start it uh, <laughs> because sometimes I forget and um, and um, yeah just get up stretch your legs uh, do what you need to do I know my cousin's watching in Greece and she has to put the baby down and then come back <laughs> um, do all the things uh, pour yourself a glass of wine or make your morning coffee or grab some lunch or have a, a, a bite to eat and then come back um, and and then we'll start again with the second half. Yeah, yeah. And in the second part of the reading, we will have more texts about our daily life and about what happens inside of us. So, yeah. See you in five minutes. <laughs> 